Mortgage Coach community, what's up? Dave Savage, Tuesday interview with Ryan Grant. Ryan, thank you for coming back a second time in just a couple months. Yeah, thanks for having me. Fun to be here. Yeah, well, you you crushed it. I received a lot of positive feedback on the art of homeownership. And not, I mean, it was funny. I, I got a lot of feedback from people I don't hear from a lot, like some of the industry's most successful loan officers and a lot of managers and leaders just saying how you crushed it, Ryan. So thank you for that. Thank you. That means a lot. Yeah. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, when I say Art of Homeownership and Ryan Grant, there'll be a link down below. So whether you're watching this in Facebook Live or you're watching this on our YouTube channel, we'll get a link down below. Incredible interview. Mm -hmm. I, um, it made the, one of the top interviews of 2019. And we also, it also made all time great um, playlists. So we've got a playlist for the best of the year and we've got a playlist for all time. And Ryan, you, you made both of those. So wow. what an honor. Yeah. So one of the things that came up um, in questions people wanted me to ask that we didn't <laughs> get to in that interview were just around leadership and team building. And you've, you've built a pretty impressive team. So why don't, we, why don't we just start with, tell everybody a little bit about your practice, but do it from a, a leadership and team perspective. Yeah, um, so at the moment, we, you know, I run a, a, my team, my personal production team, uh, the Ryan Grant team, and we have probably about, about eight people on that team. Uh, well, obviously we use some shared resources uh, for the branch, for the region, but um, there's probably eight specific people that are focused on that team. And then I also run a region here at Fairway Mortgage and uh, 53 or 50, I think 54 people in the region now uh, and branches all over Southern California. And we're continuing to grow that region as well. Um, and so, you know, we have a whole operations team and production staff and uh, marketing support, uh, you know, post-closing managers. Uh, we have a laundry list of people here, but uh, they're all phenomenal at what they do. And we're excited to continue that trend. Awesome. And, and then from a results perspective, you, your team did about 50 units for how much production last month? Yeah, so last month was 50 units for just over 25 million. Uh, the month before that was 50 units for almost 29 million. And then this, this month will be closer to 30 million. Um, and so hopefully we're, we'll track to about 180 million this year for our team. And then as a region, uh, we're looking at about 650 million uh, for all the originators in our, in our group. Cool. So if you guys have questions, ask them below. Uh, but the theme of this whole call is leadership and team building. So before I just start getting into tactical questions around leadership and team building, let's, why don't you just tell your story and let's literally start like there was once upon a time that you'd never closed 10 loans in a single month. And I'm sure, Very much so. you know, like, like just about everybody I know that got in the mortgage business. It's like, I want to make $10,000 in a month. Okay. Check. I want to close 10 loans in a month, check. And then everybody kind of has a different, and by, by the way, not everybody gets to check that box. Not everybody yeah. hits those milestones, but give us, give us kind of the milestones that you had when you got in the business and the various, um, I don't know, just accomplishments you hit from your perspective. Yeah. So I started, uh, I, you know, I've been in the business since 2005, but I really was, you know, I was a broker just doing call center refi stuff and, uh, I really consider having two two careers in the mortgage industry or, or one job and one career. Uh, but when I when I made the decision to get into relationship-based lending and you know work closely with clients and real estate agents and business professionals and by referral, um, I started in March of 2011 and I started with no no database, no realtor partners, no real past clients to speak of. Uh, Time out real quick. And what was the most production you'd done at that point? You know, what kind of loan officer were you? Uh, I, to be honest, there, there was no like numbers. I would just, you know, when I was started in 2005, 2006, I would just answer the phone and do refinances and they never really kept track of what we did. There was no scoreboards. There was no, it was really a poorly run operation to say the least. Um, and so from that point on, I got into kind of management and I, I wasn't, I haven't originated for a long time. Um, so it was in March, 2011. I really didn't have a track record of originating other than answering the phone and trying to get some refinances done. Um, got in, it. My in my first year, so 2011, I closed uh, $11 million in production, uh, which was, you know, a little more than a million dollars. And in our world, that's probably three or four loans uh, per month on average. And uh, the second year was, we did 60 million. The year after that was 98 million. And then 
went to 125 and 150 and so on and so forth. So you you got after it pretty quick. So you had call it like a, a five to six year period where you fumbled and bumbled and was a loan officer. In 2011, you got serious. By the way, did anything happen? Did you have kids? Did you get yeah. married? Like, did some life event happen that got you to, okay, I need to get serious? Yeah, I was just tired of the, the roller coaster of the industry, right? So there was, you know, making decent money uh, during the subprime era, uh, and then that market crashed. And then, you know, I, I started managing for a company, and then you know, they cut my income, and, and then rates went up at the end of 2010. And so all the people I was managing, all their production went down. And I was just tired of the roller coaster of income. So I was actually going to get out of the business and try and go get my MBA and see what I wanted to do. And my dad just basically said, hey, you know, what about going to talk to realtors and, you know, trying to get them to refer you business and like, you know, using maybe more of your personality. And I was just, I said, that seems hard. Um, I didn't know that was a thing at the time. I didn't know that relationship, relationship based lending was a thing. I just thought you answered phones when they rang. Um, so it was a whole new world for me uh, and it was a scary world, but it was one that I figured I'll give it one more last shot and um, hindsight being what it is. I'm glad I did. Nice. And when, when did you, um, become part of the sales mastery and Todd Duncan community. Cause I, that's how I know you, you and I have met at sales masteries. You've spoken there, you know, when did that become part of your, yeah, I, your want say, uh, I want to say like 2015, um, I think is when I spoke for the first time. Um, and I was, I mortgage at the time, maybe 2014. Uh, I can't recall, but somewhere on there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's, Let's start really getting into tactics because you've learned a lot now. And, and, and I, I think if I would have asked you, what is leadership? What is team building in 2011? And the way you'll answer that today will be different. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I put the headline for this, leadership and team building. So what, what's the difference and, and how do you define leadership? Yeah, I think, you know, to me, leadership is about uh, motivating. It's about... Uh, leading by example. Uh, it's about inspiring your team to be more than what they currently are. Uh, I think managing is more, you know, managing is getting people to do what they're supposed to do uh, and ensuring people do what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's, you know, I would consider it very much like babysitting. Um, and I've never wanted to be a manager. I always, you know, when I first was started my production career, I didn't even want to hire loan officers. I just wanted to focus on my own production and kind of, you know, run a small team and, you know, help lead them. And over time, that's obviously evolved, but uh, I think leadership is, you know, empowering people to become more than they currently are uh, and not just making sure they should do with the, the minimum they should be doing. So your ultimate, the way you see the responsibility of a leader is to help people become everything they can become. That's, that's how you see it. Yeah, just getting the best out of people, right? And getting more out of them than maybe they thought they had uh, and really Know, inspiring them and motivating them through you know our culture through our best practices through our teamwork um, to really help everybody up level their positions uh, both personally and professionally got it so how, how do you do that like let's start breaking that down like you know do you have a process on you know the people that work for you one how do you know what their goals are and what optimal success is you know do you have a process for that and if so, kind of describe it in as much detail as you're willing to describe it. Yeah. So, you know, depending upon whether you're, you know, in the operations or support portion of our team or whether you're in the, you know, the production uh, side of our team, whether there is a mortgage, mortgage professional or a production partner, um, we really get clear on what everybody wants to accomplish. Right. And, um, you know, we, we know that, you know, I have the, the benefit of making all the mistakes uh, in terms of, you know, bad hires and hiring the wrong people and, you know, hiring out of need and, uh, you know, not knowing who to hire next. And so I've kind of had all those issues in the past. And so it's easy for me to help people now, you know, take someone from a million dollars a month in fundings to $10 million a month in fundings or you know, someone who is funding a loan every other month to now doing consistently, you know, 12 to 15 loans a month. And it's because, we have the process, right? We know exactly who to hire. We know what they do. We know what support that person needs uh, and we can help them go accomplish those goals and then set new goals. Uh, for our operations team, it's, it's very similar, right? We, you know, we know where they are when they join us and then we figure out what they want to become, right? And we work towards that. And uh, our operations manager has been phenomenal in that 
in that realm to help that team grow. Um, and we really just, you know, we focus on not only professional growth, but personal growth. Uh, we talk a lot about health and wellness and mindfulness. Uh, we're all going to do a cleanse coming up here uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, coming into the holiday season. And so we do a lot of that type of stuff to help um, make sure that we're not just focused solely on work, but uh, on our lives as well. Love it. So we got a lot of great people watching this call. I just saw Jeremy Forcier weigh in, who I, uh, I was on site with Jeremy last week. So another great leader that yeah. I should do an interview like this on, like leadership mm -hmm. and team building with Jeremy. Uh, but I, I say that because anybody that's watching this right now, I always believe like the question after the question is the best question. So if you guys have a question you want me to ask Ryan, let me know down below. I will ask those. But a question that came to mind after hearing you kind of describe everything that you do, you said you had a process of how you pick the right people. Like walk us through that. Like how do you pick the people that you bring into your team? Do you have some criteria? Do you have, you know, some testing that you do? Do you have an interview process? Like give us a high level on how you identify people that you think will be successful. Yeah, so it, it, you know, it didn't start th this way. It started as, you know, if they sounded decent, they would hire them because we needed them, right? We, we did what most people do is we work, 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 get really busy and we go, oh, now we need more people and we hire out of need. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, so we really started to figure out that we need to hire ahead of our production and that's hard to do, uh, not only for yourself, but for your team, because you know, it takes confidence, right? It takes the ability to know that when you hire this person, you can offload X, Y, and Z to go focus on A, B, and C. And you just have to be the type of person that actually goes and does that and not just takes the extra time for themselves. Um, so we, the first thing we did is realize we have to hire ahead of production. Uh, we have to allow someone to grow into the support that we offer them. Uh, and from a hiring perspective, uh, it's pretty intense to get hired here. Um, we are very protective of our culture. We all follow the ideal team player uh, book, basically model where you have to be humble, hungry, and smart. Uh, so we do an initial phone interview. Uh, then we do a panel interview uh, with three of the most appropriate members on our team. They do an hour long written test. Uh, then we do a follow-up interview with myself as the last one. Then we all kind of convene as a panel and figure out if we think it's the right person. And then you know, we go ahead and make the decision at that point. Um, not to say that we've never made a bad hire with that process, but uh, we've definitely uh, we've definitely really flushed out the people who didn't didn't we didn't think they would make it right, and and that really helps. And then I think secondarily is when your culture is so strong, and when everybody is so bought in, if someone is a part of that culture and does not buy in and does not fit in, it's really apparent to see right and and oftentimes they will leave before we ask them to leave because they just feel out of place, um, which is okay, right? It's, it's actually what we would prefer is that, you know, not everybody is a fit, not everybody is a, a high achiever and, and not everybody has the same mentality as the rest of us. So uh, we all operate as kind of the, the, the boat, the Marine boat theory, right? Where you have your uh, Navy SEALs uh, carrying the boats and whoever, you know, whoever's not carrying their weight, the rest of the people feel it. And so we, uh, we talk about that a lot. Well, I, I like that because, you know, I also believe in this concept that authorship is ownership and you're letting your team author who bring, who comes in just by the very nature that they're going through, you know, these three interviews and your team's yeah. involved in it. You, you mentioned a specific book. I know people are going to go, what was that book again? Mm -hmm. Would you yeah. remind us of the book that you guys all follow? Yeah, it's called The Ideal Team Player. Uh, it's one of the best, okay. one of the best books for culture and team building and growth that, that I've read. And, and let's talk about that real quick. You've read it, your team's read it. Do you have a process that when you have a book or a piece of content that you really want to assimilate with your team, do you have a process like book club? Yeah. Do you just buy it for everybody and hope they read it? Or do you have a way in which you guys assimilate new content into your leadership platform? Yeah, so we have a book of the month club. Um, you know, we just finished, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Oh, not, uh, it was a financial book. I'm drawing a blank on the book we just read, but um, you know, we've read Ideal Team Player, we've read Good to Great, we've read Starts With Why, uh, and we always you know, pick a book and we just basically ask, hey, if you wanna be a part of this, we will buy you the book. You just have to commit to reading it. And then we all go out to lunch or happy hour and we all bring our books and we sit down and we spend about an hour talking about it and what it meant professionally, what it meant personally, 
Um, and that's it's something that's really helped from a cult's perspective. And we've gotten a lot of great feedback from people that weren't very well read before. Uh, maybe they just, you know, kind of were like most people and they'd go home and watch TV. And so it's, it's really helped people from a life perspective as well, as well as a professional perspective. Love that. Uh, Jeremy Forcier just posted a question. Can I get a copy of your format, interview questions and tests? Are yeah. you cool with sharing that with the community? Yeah. Okay, so anybody who wants that, we'll have a link down below. Uh, I'll make sure that there's a link in the Facebook group live that you guys are watching right now. And then if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, we'll have a somehow like you're seeing it in YouTube, there'll be a description and there'll be a link to some resources. So thank you, Ryan, if you can forward that afterwards. Of course. And, uh, and guys, keep the questions coming. So I think that's pretty good. Like I've got a feel for your, how you identify teams, your process, um, how you educate people while they're there. What about like, you know, the, 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 the concept that hire slow, fire fast. Um, when it sounds like in many cases, the way that your team works, people are self-selecting. But let's talk about firing fast. So let's talk about when you do have to make a decision to get someone off the team. Any, any wisdom you'd have for the community on that? Yeah, so, you know, I really love Darren Hardy's approach about, you know, hiring A players. You know, Darren says when you hire an A player, they're free because they'll make you more money than you can pay them. Uh, so hiring slow is definitely a key, right? And you want to hire A players and you want to source them and they're hard to come by. So you, know, you end up saying no a lot more than you say yes. And that's a really hard thing to do, especially if you're hiring out of need. It's really hard to do at that point. So the key is, again, is hire ahead of growth. That way you can hire smart and you can be really selective with who you bring in. Make sure they're an A player. Uh, but again, sometimes you're going to miss, right? And I think the firing fast thing, I've never been a huge proponent of firing fast. Uh, and that could just be, you know, a, a personal fault of mine. Um, I, know, I know some people uh, would, would subscribe to that theory. But ultimately, we kind of take Jocko Willick's approach where we talk about, you know, up-leveling or escalated coaching uh, which is where, you know, we use the extreme ownership method. If, if someone makes a mistake, it's my fault. If they make it again, it's still my fault. If they make it again, well, then we start looking at, okay, you know, maybe it's both of our faults, right? And then we, over time, we start to continue to coach them up or coach them out. Um, so I, I want to give people the benefit of doubt, especially if they've passed our, our hiring process at the beginning. That means that there's something there, um, you know, and, and maybe it's just our fault that we're not tapping into it. And so, we really try and you know, own the issue first. And then over time, if we just feel like it's not a good fit, what'll typically happen is again, that, that person will probably just leave on their own uh, as opposed to being asked to leave uh, because they realize that they're just, they're not a fit for our culture. Got it. So let's talk about some tactical things that I know team leaders have a challenge getting others to do. And, and I'm gonna focus on two. One is how the CRM is used. You know, like that was one thing that really, I thought distinguished Jeremy when I was spent time in his office as he was sitting in his office, you know, he had Salesforce open, he had mortgage coach open and you know, his team, they just had a way of putting a to do, create a TCA. They had good direction and part of his, and Jeremy, and I'm not saying every top producer should be creating their own TCA. Jeremy does. He creates his own TCA. I know in a lot of teams, there'll be a production assistant that does the setup of it. But let's just say getting team adoption to things like using CRM, using Mortgage Coach. So first of all, how do you document and communicate those standards? How do you train people in different roles to do those little things that matter? And walk us through that. Yeah, so from the from the beginning, you know, when we hire somebody, they, they go through a pretty in-depth uh, onboarding process where you know, a lot of reasons why people join our region is because they want to operate the way we do, right? They want the, pl they want the playbook, uh, they want the platform, they want to have the initial phone call the way we have it. You know, we call it our dreams and goals call. Uh, our client intake, the questions we ask are very much different than what most mortgage originators, most, most mortgage originators ask. Um, the, the secondary follow-up meeting, whether it's a webinar or an in-person consultation has a very step-by-step -step process. We have the whole presentation that we give. And, you know, again, when you're a part of our region, you get all that. Uh, and then from there, you know, it goes into the, the follow-up process for a pre-approved client when they're searching for homes, when they go into contract, we have what's called a contract meeting. 
Um, you know, there's a certain step-by-step -step process all the way through. So every person works to the same process and the same metric. And we teach them all how to use the CRM to make sure that there's always a next definitive action on every file. So no file just has a conversation and stops. There's always a, a next action that our CRM tells us what to do. Uh, we task out all of our responsibilities to the operations team. Uh, so it's a, it's a really dialed in machine that um, I think it's one of the biggest mistakes that loan officers make is they operate without a system or without accountability of that system. Uh, and it's hard to do in our world, right? Because we have a lot of top 1% originators working in our region. And so if you're not one of those people and you're looking at these top 1% originators, it, it becomes very clear, maybe I should just do what they're doing, right? Maybe I should just adopt to the system and stop trying to do it my old way, uh, which is something that uh, has really helped a lot of our people. And so I'm a firm believer in systems and processes and all of our submission forms look the same. All of our refinance you know, commission sheet or contract sheets look the same. Uh, and our team knows not to work on them unless those are all filled out. So it's just, it helps the whole, helps the whole, uh, the region. So hopefully the takeaway for everybody on this is have systems, be consistent. You cannot scale, you know, and when I talk about scale, I'm talking north of 10 loans a month yeah. consistently or north of a hundred loans a year consistently. Like if you work hard, if you work smart, if you have good communication skills, if you know how to solve problems in the transaction, you can close 60 loans a year. Yeah. And in some people, you could close 60 years in 20 hours a week, and you could close 60 loans a year in 80 hours a week, you know, like, but, but to consistently, sustainably crush it, you need to have systems, you need to have processes, you need to do those consistently. So, and, and I think everybody knows that intellectually, um, even people that don't do it, but any advice you have, because it sounds like you know you're always optimizing people, but someone who's listening to this that has been chronically you know closing less than fifty loans a year, yeah, talk to them as a sales manager. You know, like what advice do you have? Because by the way, you were that guy. You know, just okay. hearing you out, like you were that guy for six years, yeah. And then something happened, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to get serious." And literally three straight years, you sounds like you doubled, tripled your business. So yeah. what advice do you have for people that are in that like struggle zone to get out of that and start executing consistently? Yeah, we get a lot of phone calls from loan officers who, you know, are inquire about joining our region or becoming a part of our team. And uh, the, the biggest thing that I hear consistently is I just can't get through X, right? And X could be three loans a month, it could be eight loans a month, it could be 15 loans a month, right? But they, they're, they're stuck there. And the typical reason is because either they themselves hasn't, haven't invested in the infrastructure and support staff it takes to get to the next level or their company hasn't supported that. And that's a problem because you just physically can't do it, right? And then have a good work-life balance and have it be consistent. Now, you could shoot the moon and if you're at eight loans, you could do 15 a few months in a row, but you're not gonna be able to sustain that because you're gonna be working you know, 80 hours a week to pull that off. And if you have a family and if you enjoy health, uh, it's gonna be a problem, right? So. Um, we teach everybody exactly what it takes to get from five to six loans to 11 to 12 to 17 to 18. And, you know, we know exactly who you need to hire you know, what those people need to do. And then every time you hire somebody, you basically fire yourself, right? So you fire yourself from doing the things you used to do before you hire that next person. And then you do it again and again. And ultimately you fire yourself until you're only doing three things every single day. And anyone in our world, if we, if we catch them doing one of those, you know, something outside of those three things, uh, we try and make it real clear that they shouldn't do that. So yeah, that brings up a good point. That was another thing when I was at Jeremy's office, you know, he had a whiteboard and the biggest quote in his office, and I can't remember it verbatim, but it was like, you know, you need to surrender the me for the we. Yep. And it, it's all about, you know, being clear on the lane that you need to be in and then stay in that lane. Like I, I had dinner with Katie Pastor, a good friend of mine. Well, Katie Pastor Trinidad, she's married to Dan Trinidad now. And, and she's, you know, top producer, killing it. But, you know, there's another level she wants to go to. And, and getting in that right lane is important. So walk, walk loan officers through, you know, how do you um, define your role? Like, do you guys, I assume you have job descriptions. Oh, yeah. And, you know, walk us through your process for getting clear on 
what your lane is. And let's, let's try to cater the, how you answer this question to the loan officer that doesn't have an assistant that, you know, either they don't deserve an assistant because they're not running consistent systems and processes so that they can bring in people and be successful. Yeah. Um, walk us through that process. How to, yeah. how to define things. Yeah, so it, it, it should be real clear, right? I mean, as, as an originator, you want to do three things every day. You want to meet with and talk to new potential clients or prospects. You want to meet with or talk to potential referral partners, TPAs, realtors, financial planners, so on and so forth. And you want to work on growth-based activities, right? Now, when you are a sole originator without a production partner or an assistant or you know, any pre-approval specialist, then you have to wear every hat, right? You're the you're the pre-approval specialist, you're the application taker, you're the social media manager, you're the marketing team, you're the business development team. And you have to get real clear that, you know, you want to get to five to six or seven or eight, depending, depending upon your market, you want to get to whatever number is necessary to be able to hire your first production partner. Uh, and at that point, you then want to be able to offload as much as possible to them to allow you to focus on those three things as much as possible. Now, again, with just two people, you're going to have to share some roles and responsibilities. Um, but as you continue to grow and as you continue to scale, then the roles get really, really defined. Uh, and everybody does, you know, mainly three things. Cause I think that anybody that's focusing on doing more than three things consistently is not going to do any of them all that well. Uh, so the goal would be that every person on your team has a top, you know, top triangle of things they should be doing. And uh, that's something that we really focus on. So, you know, from an originator's perspective, you know, I think that the number one thing you can do is have your production partner manage your email um, and, and really get out of email because we are very much emotional people, uh, typically people in sales, even though I don't like the term sales, um, consultants, loan officers, you know, mortgage professionals. We are emotional beings. We drive based on emotion. We, you know, grow our business. And if we see an email about a file that maybe ha may have an issue or two, we immediately stop what we're doing and we don't think about growth, we think about putting out a fire. Um, so if you're listening to this and you're asking yourself, why am I putting out more fires than growing? Um, it's probably a, either a lack of confidence in the team that supports you or a lack of a team in the first place. And that's where you wanna make sure that you make some good hires to be able to support you in those areas. So a takeaway for everybody who just heard that, if you don't have a team, you, you either need to discipline yourself that once you start prospecting and you're getting a call time in, that nothing gets in the way. And even if you get a fire, okay, I'm gonna put that fire out an hour from now. Um, Cause not everybody on this call has someone that can filter that. But, but here is the deal and the truth that I know is that your success will directly be related to the number of people that you talk to from a business growth perspective. And then the quality of that conversation. So if you're talking to a bar, and you're not asking great questions, you're not delivering a total cost analysis, you're not gonna have the best conversion. And then I also know if you're constantly just going from problem, 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 and then the end of the day comes and you're like, oh, I didn't have time for my two hours of three hours of prospecting a day. It's again, you will, the truth will happen. You will make less money and you won't have a sustainable career to where you can have an assistant and justify it. Um, so a couple questions came in, and I think you might have answered this. Jeremy wanted to know, what are your top three jobs today? So now you've got a team, you've got a region. What are your top three jobs today? Yeah, so my top three jobs at the moment are strategic partnerships for the Ryan Grant team. So to continue to grow and develop strategic partnerships uh, to help us continue to help more families over time as a team. It's to continue to grow and foster you know, new ideation in the region to set us apart. Uh, so to you know, open new market centers, to find new talent and to develop that new talent so we can be more of what we are in other areas. Uh, and we're excited to do that. And then lastly, it's to, uh, in, in my world, I'm focusing on the art of home ownership because I believe that that is the future of the real estate mortgage space. And you know, we want to help get that into as many hands as people as possible that, that, you know, that should have it. Love it. So check out art of home ownership down below again. Um, Elizabeth, Toon just said, how to communicate the roles, lanes and roles to the team and how to make sure no one says, that's not my job. So, I mean, you might have spoken to that, but I think she put some nuances into that. And, and guys, first of all, Elizabeth, thank you for asking questions. Jeremy, rock it out. 
Um, someone did ask questions about comp. I'm not gonna get into comp. I am gonna bring your question in in a minute, but getting into specific compensation is a slippery slope. Um, I'm not gonna do that in this you know, public interview. Um, but why don't you answer Liz, um, Elizabeth's question and then I'll, I've got a couple more questions that have come in from the community. Yeah, what was Elizabeth's question? She wanted to know um, how to best communicate the lanes and roles to the team and how to make sure no one says, it's not my job. Yeah, um, you know, if you read the book, Ideal Team Player, and that was a required reading for our whole team, is that that is an unacceptable uh, term, right? And so essentially what it is, is somebody will take that on and then they will then train in whomever, you know, was supposed to handle that so it doesn't happen again. But nobody rejects a task or an opportunity to help the team in any way. Uh, people actually, you know, we have the opposite problem, right? People overreach and, you know, they take on more than what they should do. And that actually throws the system off. So uh, we actually have to keep people in their lanes from taking on more than they should, as opposed to, you know, shunning or, or not taking on tasks. Uh, in terms of accountability and how we do that, um, it's just such a well-run machine. Our operations manager is, is probably, you know, 100% uh, given credit for that. But it's real clear to see where an issue happened, right? And, and again, once that issue happens, we don't then look at that person and say, hey, you made a mistake. We look at ourselves, you know, I'm my operation manager, myself, our production manager, we look at ourselves and say, okay, we failed, right? We, we didn't train this person. And then what inevitably happens is they say, no, you did train me, it was my fault, it won't happen again. So extreme ownership really breeds heavily in our office and it, you just don't, you don't get away with not doing your job because we're such a high functioning team that as soon as someone doesn't do it, it's just, you can see where the accident happens, right? You can see where the crash happens and we all hold each other accountable because every single person depends on the, upon the next person in here. And we don't necessarily do it for ourselves. We do it for the 54 other people that we have to support each day. Yeah, so you've mentioned extreme ownership a few times. For anybody that hasn't read Jocko Willink's book and Lee Fabin's book, Extreme Ownership, I mean, it's a mortgage coach community, must read. I, I've interviewed both Leaf and Jocko. You can check those interviews out. Just search our YouTube channel. Also recently did an interview with Todd Bookstan and Andrew Paul, who's the chief of staff, uh, former Navy SEAL, mortgage professional, uh, currently the chief of staff. Uh, that interview was badass because we talked about standards. It was all about standards. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I am gonna put a link to that down below. But Ryan, why don't you give a shout out to the book? And then why don't you also talk about how you took the book, socialized it, and I, I, I'm sure like you've talked about it three times, I'm sure you've made it part of your culture. So speak to that real quick. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, so Extreme Ownership for us was one of those, again, required readings where, you know, in our industry, it's so easy to, when something goes wrong and inevitably things do go wrong, we always look for who the, who's at fault. Right. Okay, whose fault was this? Who who made a mistake? Who messed up? Right? Who can, who should we yell at or who should we reprimand? And that just never works, right? Because then you know, they it just moves down the line, right? Let's say one of our loan coordinators makes a mistake on a pre-approval, and we go, hey, why'd you make that mistake? And so you go, well, it was the loan officer's fault. He didn't give me all the information. The loan officer's well, it's the client's fault, and it's just it's a never-ending cycle, right? So everyone on our team knows that there is the only fault is their own, right? And so in that specific situation, I would have said or our operations manager in this case would have said, hey, loan coordinator, my fault. I didn't train you on that. I thought you should have known that, but apparently you don't. I'm gonna own it. I'll make sure that never happens again. Loan coordinator is not gonna say, you're right. You didn't teach me that, because they did, right? So the loan coordinator then says, nope, my bad, I'll take it. And the loan officer says, nope, my bad. I actually should have asked more questions to the client. Um, and we all just kind of own it, right? And at that point, no one's feelings are hurt. No one feels attacked. And everyone feels empowered just to get better, right? And that's it's a much better environment to work in than the alternative. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, there's so many good takeaways from that book, um, but you know, just the concept of extreme ownership, and then the you know cover and move, yeah. you know, kind of speaks to the whole staying in your lane. So mortgage coach community, you know, I do believe that leadership is the most important thing everybody could grow. If you're a local referral based loan officer. If you don't have a team, you're wrong. You do have a team. You have a processor. Yeah. That's a team member. Uh, and, and by the way, your clients are your team. You know, your referral partners, all your team. 
And, and one thing I've learned at Mortgage Coach, like technology is game changing in its value, but without being powered by leadership, technology is worthless. You know, it's, that's why I do interviews like this. That's why for 11 years, I consider identifying great stories in the Mortgage Coach community, doing interviews like this, broadcasting them on social media. I consider that one of the three most important things I do because it's leadership. It's leadership to help inspire, encourage, and show people how to be successful. So, so guys, get after it, lead extreme ownership. So let's talk about total cost analysis real quick. And, and let's put it under the framework of, you know, you're, you're a big Todd Duncan guy. I know you're a coach uh, high, for high trust. Um, how do you delegate that as a team to make sure that the educational experience of a high trust total cost analysis experience happens Walk us through where that fits in your process, how you train to that, and then what kind of accountability measures do you put into place to make sure that a high trust total cost analysis experience happens? Walk us through that a little bit. And who does what? You know, like I got to see who does what in Jeremy's office. Yeah. Like what's the typical flow? Who creates the TCA? Who delivers it? Walk us through that. Yeah, so every team, you know, depending upon the depth of their team or how many people they have on their team or the roles, um, who creates the TCA is going to be a little bit different, right? Sometimes if it's a sole originator, obviously they create it. Uh, sometimes if they have a production partner who is empowered enough to take that on, then they'll take it on. Um, but everybody's a little bit different. But all in all, we all know that the client doesn't get, they, they simply never get their quote unquote loan options in the form of an email or an Excel file or you know, a, a loan estimate. Um, it's just not part of what we do, right? And uh, we always train on that. Every every Monday we train and we say, what are your wins and what are your losses? And, you know, it's incredible how when there are losses, I always ask the question, all right, did you have the, you know, the pre-purchase consultation? Did you show them the total cost analysis? Did you work through all the numbers with them? And, you know, a lot of times the losses are, no, I didn't do that. I kind of, I skipped over it. And it's like, well, it's very apparent when it works and when it doesn't. So, um, from an accountability perspective, everyone just knows that it works so well that they would not ever not do it. Uh, and so it's something that is built into our DNA. Uh, we talk to the client about it on the first phone call. So when we have that dreams and goals call, we, we let the client know when you come in for your consultation, we're going to go through your total cost analysis and we're going to work through all the options. And it's going to be the best thing that you've done in your real estate and financing journey thus far, because it's going to give you all the motivation and confidence to go make a smart decision. Uh, and that's something that script alert everybody if anybody's listening this for an edit let's cut that that was an awesome script thank you ryan yeah you're welcome um you know so really it just kind of is, is bred through everything we do and you know we would feel like we're cheating the consumer out of the education that they want and need if we didn't give them the tca and didn't review it with them and didn't walk them through it and analyze it in depth based upon their situation so anybody that just heard that and you're still giving fee worksheets, it's really clear that you just haven't built that why. Like you haven't created that standard that giving a client, you know, here's your payment, here's your interest rate, here's your cash to close. Those are the, th that's the triangle for a transaction. And, you know, but for mortgage coach, it's not a triangle. You know, it's not even a square. It's an octagon. Yeah. It's like, what's your cost over five years? Uh, what if you did that refi and you saved that $300 and you prepaid your mortgage or you invested that in an offset account with your financial planner? You know, those, there's like, there's a star, there's five data points. And, and really there's a lot more than five data points. Although I do kind of think with every borrower, it's a star, you know, like, like, you know, for some cash to close is most important, but Hey, paying that $200 a month and being cat, you know, debt free 10 years faster. So, you know, figure out what the star is. And, and it looks like you've built the why you've built the culture around the why you have that standard now. And it's like the culture takes care of itself. Is that fair enough? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's, it's something that, that feeds on itself, right? And we always try and up level the consumer experience. We try and up level the value that we provide to the consumer. So, um, yeah, again, we feel like we'd, we'd be cheating the consumer and cheating ourselves if we didn't. Any, any advice you have for someone on the, the call that's still not there and they want to build their why? You know, I, I've got a couple, you know, like suggestions, but any idea for someone that just needs to upgrade their, 
their what their personal why and their business why to deliver a more elevated experience any any breadcrumbs to help them do that yeah i mean you know everyone's why is going to be different i mean obviously that's one of our favorite books it starts with why by simon sinek and you know we've we developed our mission statement on it. We developed our vision on it, um, and so you know everything we do is kind of built around that. Now, you know you'll have a personal why, which is going to be you know, ideally family or you know legacy and you know long-term generational wealth and you know ele elevated IQ. Like those are the types of personal whys. But I think you need to get outside of that. And um, I was actually texting a good buddy of mine, Wally Olivieri, which you know well. Uh, and while he was asking, you know, he read the book, uh, Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. And um, he was kind of asking, you know, what do we ask ourselves every day to remove ego from this thing and not do it for us and do it for the consumer? And, you know, I was talking to Bill Hart the other day and I just said, Bill, I think it's insane that real estate agents give clients the largest asset they've had in their life. We then oftentimes give them the largest debt they've ever had in their life. And then we both just assume they know what they're doing and not a single company in the world has figured out how to proactively help that client from one to the next transaction. And it's just, it's ridiculous because we know that as a, as a society, we are not a well-educated consumer base, right? We buy things, we live in them, we pay for it, but we don't seek out education and we don't seek out guidance because it doesn't really exist without salespeople. And that really is our why is that we want to be the first mortgage practice and all of our realtor partners want to be the first realtor partners to deliver a higher level of value consistently through the life of the client because we really believe we can make a difference in their lives moving forward. And to us, that's all we need. Um, and just selling debt is probably more of a problem than a solution. Wow. I got, I got goosebumps. So my editing team, we want to take that why conversation. We want to edit that. Uh, I hope everybody heard that. And then here, here would be a couple of breadcrumbs for you guys. You know, one, listen to my interview with Simon Sinek. Uh, you know, he's speaking directly to real estate mortgage professionals in that. You know, listen to his TED Talk. I mean, I don't want to overwhelm you guys with two stuff. You know, like you can't obviously do Jocko Willing's book. You know, we've, we've referred three books, but I would put them on your list as a leader to grow over the next 12 months. Uh, and then here, here's the deal. If you're not delivering that elevated experience that Ryan's talking about, it's probably because you don't realize how valuable it is. You've never, you've never done a total cost analysis. Like you think you know it all, but until you really kind of like, whether it's a purchase or a refi, and you've done it like 10 times with 10 different families, you trust me on this. You know how to do a loan. You don't know the power of your advice. You just don't know it yet. Wow. You don't know what you don't know until you start playing chess versus checkers. So I would, you know, work on your why, even write it down, make it personal, make it yours, make it clear. And then you just gotta, you gotta do 10 TCAs in the real world to start really seeing the power of advice. Because to your point, Ryan, it's clear that you get it. Like you can make a difference in a family's life. You could help people pay off their debt faster. You can help people buy their next home faster. You believe that because you've done it, you know? All right, that was powerful. Okay, so I wanna make sure I reward people for asking questions. Someone asked about comp. I'm gonna tailor the question like, I don't wanna know exactly what percent is base versus commission, but if you could speak to your philosophy on team members, and I'm assuming they're talking about production, not loan officers, um, on how you, what, what are your philosophies around what should be base, what should be commission, you know, variable comp? Do you have any philosophies on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when it comes down to compensation, uh, we, we are all very highly um, driven people in our industry. That's what we're in our, in our region. That's kind of who we look to hire. And so the majority of the people would rather have um, loftier goals. Uh, and this is something that uh, Tim Brahim taught me well in his leadership 360 group was that, you know, it's better when, you know, when if the, the branch or the region is winning, that everyone wins more. Uh, and then when the branch and region is losing, that, you know, people have share in some of that because we are all rowing in the same direction at that point. I think if the branch, you know, if the only person losing is the branch and everybody's making a good salary and they're comfortable, that's a, that's a big, 
disconnect, right? And the same thing is if we shoot the moon and we make a ton of money, but then all of our people are only making a you know, small bit more, um, then there's not a huge incentive for them to continue to, to, to press and grow. And so uh, we want our wins to be their wins. We want, our lo- we want them to share in our losses. So we're all rowing in the same direction. Uh, so I'm a fan of, you know, typically lower, lower bases and higher, uh, higher commissions or higher bonuses. Uh, another thing that one of my old uh, CEOs said to me was, you know, don't overpay people uh, for a short period of time. Pay them fairly, fairly for a very long time. And I think that was, that's something that really stuck with me because a lot of mortgage companies will, especially now, right? They'll pay a bunch of money to get a bunch of processors and underwriters. And then when things slow down, they fire them and they have this hire and fire mechanism uh, that really is terrible for culture and everybody's constantly worried and you know, everyone's looking at the next month. Uh, and in our world, we don't really have that. I mean, you know, in, when things are great, everyone's happy. When things are bad, you know, everyone knows they still have a job, um, but we all realize that they're paid fairly and they're compensated well. Uh, but they get to do what they love and they get to help people for for years as opposed to being in and out of jobs. Love it. So guys, we are at the 15 minute mark. We've got 15 minutes left of this interview. If you do have some last minute questions, put them down below uh, because we may not get to them today, but we'll get to them in other interviews. And I, and if I see a question that I think is on point, I will bring it into the conversation. So still keep the questions coming. So I want to transition a little bit because I think we've got a good sense of what leadership means, what team building means, um, some ideas, some strategies. We've got quotes, we've got scripts. I mean, we could end right now, and I think this has been a fantastic interview. Um, but I want to start talking about how do you communicate your team to your realtor partners? And, and I want to first ask that in the context of how do you kind of use that as a competitive advantage, but then I also want to get some scripting and how you finesse that so that you know, people are communicating with partners in a way that adds value, but in a way that helps them scale. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, walk us through. Yeah, so I teach a, a coaching workshop series at the Orange County Association of Realtors, and we've been doing it for a couple of years now. And uh, one of the, the best classes I teach, in my opinion, and probably one of the most uh, attended classes is our, is our team building uh, seminar. So we talk about the power of a team in real estate, and uh, we allude to our team a lot, right? Because it's very similar. You know, building a real estate team, building a mortgage team are very, very much the same. Um, but you know, obviously the roles can be a little bit different. So when we talk to real estate agents, it's important to get them to understand because we've worked with agents in the past who said, you know, you have a team and that's great, but I just kind of like dealing with one person. And I like having one go-to loan officer and they're always available. And I, that always makes me chuckle, right? Because one loan officer can be good until they're not. Right. And when they're not, it means they're overwhelmed. They have too many realtors. You can only be good for so long without hiring a team, because if you're good, more people realize it. More people want to send you business. More people want to do business with you. And then your turn times slow down. Your communication is done is is less. Your lead follow up is worse. And so I always ask the question, like, if he's that good, is he your only is he the only person working with you? I mean, is he not working with other any agents? Because at some point, he's going to go on vacation. He's going to be sick. He's going to be with his family and you're not going to get the level of service and the you know, business acumen you deserve. Whereas with our team, you know, we have someone available seven days a week, you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we have everybody consistently doing the same thing with clients every single time. So one of my favorite questions to ask an agent is, do you know exactly what happens when you refer a client to your current lender from the first phone call to 50 years later? And no agent has ever to this, to this date said, yes, I know that. Uh, everyone goes, no, I just, I know they do a good job and they get them pre-approved and they close the loan. And I said, well, that's problematic because that may or may not be helping your business, right? And so when we meet with an agent, we walk them through exactly what our client presentation looks like and how many people it takes to pull that off. And then we walk them through our before, during, and after value proposition, and how many people it takes to pull that off, right? And after being the most important part. Uh, and then we attribute that to 10 ways in which we can help their business. Um, and I, I, again, I love asking the question, you know, do you have a, a lending resource or do you have a lending partner? Uh, and it really makes them think, yeah, I guess I just kind of have a lending resource, right? Someone I send loans to when they need them uh, because a partner would you know, allude to the fact that they're active in helping them grow their business and that that's typically not the case. Love that. So I hope the takeaways, the, the one 
do you know how they take, you know, from transaction to 50 years later? I think that was super powerful. And then, and we're going to show you 10 ways to help your business. And, and here's a, a clue for some of you folks. The fact that you're doing annual reviews and you're actually implementing and executing annual reviews is a massive competitive advantage. It serves the family because it gives the family some accountability and some education around how they can use the real estate strategically. And then it helps the realtor because you're gonna help them achieve their real estate goals faster. So I know there's a lot more to it than that, Ryan, but wouldn't you agree that like if loan officer could just start delivering this total cost analysis at the point of sale where they're delivering more than the triangle of a transaction, they're delivering the star of advice. And then literally on an annual basis, they, they met up and continued to drive that. Like that's a big part of the equation. And I know there's more to it because you know, you've got the whole art of a home ownership platform, but that is a very big part of that offer. Yeah, that's what we talk about a lot is, you know, most realtors don't realize this, but almost every loan originator in America is doing more harm than good in terms of helping them continue the sales cycle. And when I tell them that, they kind of, they get a little bit, you know, curious and wow, what do you mean? And it's like, well, if I'm an average loan officer and you send me an average client, if let's say he's paying $2,200 a month in rent and, you know, his new mortgage payment after I get done pre-approving, it was going to be $3,600. And I tell them, hey, congratulations, Joe, you're pre-approved. You can go buy a new house. Payment's 3,600 bucks. Let me know when you find one. Right? I really just turn Joe off. Right? I've basically been nothing more than an online mortgage calculator. Whereas you know, when we show the agent what we go through, right? how we show them the total cost analysis, how we show them the tax benefit, the principal portion, you know, the increase in you know, property values over time, the increase in rent over time. And I say, look, I'm going to get to the same exact number as the other originator, you know, give or take a couple dollars. The only difference is, as opposed to scaring the client, we're going to actually motivate them and make them realize it's financially irresponsible not to buy the home. And that's a big takeaway that most realtors don't, don't get. And I say, look, people are just not very good auditory learners, right? So we have to have this visual, we have to show them TCA, we have to have them in the office, and you know, we're not gonna do anything tricky. We're just going to you know, show them the difference between what they can do and what they should do. And what they should do is where they, where they miss. Uh, and that's really important that for agents to know that you and your team are helping them help their clients make good decisions. Love that. So let's, we've got eight minutes left, Ryan. Let's one, make sure we, we do uh, a recommendation for folks to go to Sales Mastery. And then I want to close out with just some, I got one more question and I have some things I want to follow up on, but I, I'm going to Sales Mastery. I've been to every Sales Mastery for, I don't know, 27 years. I went there as an originator, you know, new loan officer trying to become successful. You know, I launched Mortgage Coach from the stage. And me personally, I just believe that not only is there great content on stage, there's some of the most successful, amazing people in the industry to network with. You know, like you, like Wally Elderberry, you know, just a lot of really amazing humans. But what's, what's your why sales mastery uh, for the Mortgage Coach community? Like why, why should loan officers spend the money, take the time to go there in today's market? I think just learning from other originators. I mean, that's, that's a lot of where we all get our stuff from. I mean, there are some new ideas, but most new, most ideas are ideas that have been around for a while and it's just implementing them is a the difference. So, you know, for me being around high producing originators, being around driven people, it always kind of resets me and re-motivates me and gives me new ideas and helps me implement things at a higher level. Um, so I think that, you know, from an industry perspective, oftentimes we all can feel like we're on an island. Uh, and anytime we get the opportunity to connect with other like-minded originators and take them to lunch, go grab coffee, you know, pick their brain, you know, get information. I mean, there's no better, no better way to, uh, to do that than just be around those people. Yeah, and, and here's the last thought I have is, I don't know, the recent you know, shoot up in interest rates, I read some article yep. that literally there's like 2 million less people that are going to do a refi right now, whatever, whatever the number is, it's yeah. a lot. Yep. Like rates have changed and, and, you know, purchase business is sustainably where it's at. Everybody in the mortgage industry right now, we're kind of, we're celebrating. I mean, and by the way, if you're not celebrating, you should be assuming you're having record months, but most of the people in the mortgage coach community right now, they are breaking personal records. You know, we have money, 
um, I'm not saying go to sales mastery as a boondoggle. Um, be frugal, be thoughtful, but it's just a great time that we have something to celebrate. We've got money to travel. Go there and get ready for 2020. So reminder to everybody, I will be hosting a champagne toast out by the pool um, before the kickoff. Um, just keep an eye on our community, our Facebook group, and you'll know the details of where to meet, but we'll be doing it the same place Todd Booksman and I did it last year. Um, so stay tuned on that. If you haven't signed up for Sales Mastery yet, it's salesmasteryevents.com, mortgage coach, put a hyphen between mortgage and coach, and there's a special discount for you guys. So check it out. So, so Ryan, let's, let's focus these last five minutes to the solo LO that wants to, to get a team member. Yeah. So first of all, what are the three activities that you don't have a team yet, you want a team, what are the three activities that loan officer needs to focus on right now? Yeah, so the first thing you have to do is, you know, have production, right? Because it's, it's difficult to hire somebody without the revenue to pay them, right? So focus on dollar producing activities, which is going to be you know, prospecting, open houses, you know, contacting agents, uh, contacting database, CPAs, financial planners. There's, there's seven pillars uh, in terms of where to draw your business from. And you want to make sure that you're approaching all seven of those pillars, right? And you're you're not just focused on one. I talked to a, a guy who is, we're, we're thinking about hiring the other day and he was so focused on real estate agents and just really dialed in. On, I, this is all I need to be doing. Uh, he missed out on the other six altogether, right? Which is uh, where you can really, all that stuff can come together and you can subsidize the other areas. Um, so focus on those things, get your production up to where you have at least three or four loans a month. Um, I was asked in that coaching workshop I did the other day, you know, someone said that, you know, I don't know, it was Mike Ferry or someone who said, you want to get to, you know, 40 transactions a year before you hire your first assistant. I, you know, and that obviously from a real estate perspective, um, I couldn't disagree more. I, if you believe in yourself and if you're confident and if you know that given the time and energy to go do the things you should be doing and to get all the mundane minutia off your plate, um, I'd say once you start getting three, four, five loans a month done, and again, depending upon your market, because, you know, volumes are different or loan amounts are different, um, you know, that's when you want to hire your first uh, production partner. And that production partner should be managing your email. They should be managing your calendar. They should be following up on your leads. They should be you know, ensuring that you're not doing the small things and you're focused on the bigger things. Uh, and then the next hire would be, in our world, would be a loan coordinator, uh, where that's kind of your pre-approval specialist. Um, I think it's in, insane that we have highly talented influencers calculating income, looking at credit, um, you know, looking at assets, looking at guidelines, chasing conditions, talking and underwriting. Um, that's not what your highest and best use is as an originator typically. Um, so, you know, depending upon where you are, what company you're with or who supports you, um, get real clear on like, if you are a talented influencer, that's what you should be doing. And you should be supported by you know, people who, you know, can do those other tasks probably a lot of times better than you, right? Because we're different brain type people. So, so uh, yeah. So, so what, um, what are the average loan amounts in your market, Orange County? Uh, our, our average loan amount is probably just north of 500,000. So, so guys, you know, make, take that in mind. Um, in just about every market, it's somewhere between five and 10 loans consistently a month. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, 40, I would say is on the low, like if you're in a high balance Orange County market, maybe, but you know, 50 loans or more, you know, and sustainably, and here's the deal. If you can't manage yourself, you're going to yeah. have a hard time managing someone else. So are you consistently time blocking and winning by noon? That's why I love Todd Books fans win by noon. Are you winning by noon? And, and what are your three? And yeah, if they aren't prospecting, if it's not having quality, high trust mortgage coach conversations, you know, if you're not doing that yourself, you're going to have a hard time managing a team to do it. So, so get after it. Ryan, dude, you have crushed it. Any last words of wisdom you just have for the mortgage coach community as we wrap up today's interview? Uh, I would just say, you know, I, make your habits consistent, right? I mean, it, it, one thing that when you become a loan officer and you start to hire somebody, you, you become a leader, whether you want to be or not. Um, you definitely should not consider yourself a manager. I, I think that term is widely overused. Um, so be consistent in your habits because that will allow you to continue to lead other people with that as well. Um, you know, I don't want to keep dr book dropping, but you know, Compound Effect by Darren Nardi is a book that teaches us all just keep doing the small things every day and over time. 
you will beat out the people who start to get bored, who start to get disinterested, who start to lose focus. Um, and that's what will really help you. And whenever anybody asks me how we became as successful as we are, it's just by doing all the little things every day and having all your team members follow that same strategy. And uh, I know it's hard to do, especially now, because there's probably a lot of people that are burnt out. They just, you know, got done doing, you know, three record months in a row. And uh, you kind of want to pump the brakes a little bit heading into Q4. Um, the difference between how well you do next year and the, and the years moving forward are going to be what you do now. And if you continue to do the small things. So I know they're hard. They're hard to do. Uh, they're also hard not to do. Uh, so focus on keep doing those small things and, and watch the compound effect take off. I, I love that. You know, just ties into you. You pick your habits and your habits pick your life and your income level. So to get after that. So I'm a big fan of the art of home ownership. There'll be a link down below to our, our interview on that. But if for anyone that wants to know more about art of home ownership, I know you're, I don't know if you're doing weekly kind of demo calls, but where could, where should they go to learn more about what art of home ownership other than our, our last interview? Yeah, just go to art of home uh, You can, you can read all through all the information about it. You can click on mortgage professionals and there is information where you can sign up and then we can invite you to one of our webinars where we talk more about it. Uh, we're doing our, our beta phase right now. We'll be rolling it out probably the next 30 to 60 days and um, it's going to be market specific. So uh, we're only going to, we're going to limit it to a certain number of originators per market. Uh, so if you're interested in locking down your market and having uh, full advantage of it, then we'd, we'd love to chat with you about it. Cool. Well, I hope you guys got value. If you like today's call, give us a like in whatever social media channel you're watching this. If you loved it, love it. Share it with your mortgage friends. Uh, for everybody that wants to take leadership to the next level, you know, schedule a meeting and talk about parts of today's interview. Um, Ryan, you crushed it, bro. Can't wait till the next one, man. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you having me. All right. See you at Sales Mastery in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Later. Bye-bye.